The history of England is rife with instances of bizarre phenomenons that have left their mark on society, shaping cultures and ideologies in unique ways. One such phenomenon was the Victorian era fascination with ancient Egypt, a period characterized by both curiosity and a penchant for the unusual. Victorian England in particular was a time of adhering to propriety, maintaining rules of etiquette and a well-defined social order. However, beneath the facade of decorum, an undercurrent of fascination with the unusual has always seemed to persist. For instance, this era witnessed the crafting of jewellery from loved ones' hair and the rise of seances and paranormal investigations. Additionally, performing mourning, characterized by dressing in black for extended periods, sometimes spanning up to two years, was another trend that emerged during this time which we might now consider to be a bit unusual. Thus, bizarrely, while adhering to rigid societal norms, Victorian culture was paradoxically heavily influenced by the strange and otherworldly. As we consider this Victorian fascination with the enigmatic, it's no wonder high society England in the 19th century was drawn to Egyptology or the study of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, with its towering pyramids, complex hieroglyphics, and mysterious rituals, existed as a civilization shrouded in mystique and grandeur. It was a land where pharaohs were perceived as god kings and where complex beliefs about the afterlife guided mortuary practices. In contrast, Victorian England of the 19th century was marked by industrialization, urbanization, and a rapidly evolving societal landscape. The Victorians were propelled by a desire for progress, innovation, and exploration, and they found themselves captivated by the alluring aura of ancient Egypt. Among the remarkable developments in England's foray into Egyptology was the concept of mummy medicine, commonly referred to as mummia. The practice involved the use of powdered remains obtained from the flesh of ancient Egyptian mummies, which was believed to contain powerful medicinal properties because, I mean, apparently sure, why not? As to how this belief came about, beginning sometime in the 12th century and continuing on until the 17th or 18th century, the idea was that because mummies were embalmed with natural bitumen, a heavy type of natural oil from the Dead Sea, consuming ground up mummy flesh would provide the user with an excellent source of natural minerals needed to heal their body and cure all number of ailments. It's unclear exactly how effective this treatment was, as well as how or why the practice eventually ended, but we can reasonably assume that the cost and effort put into producing this type of medicine likely was not worth whatever minimal effect it had on sick patients. But as you can imagine, the bizarre practice of consuming mummy flesh driven by the belief in its health benefits was emblematic of high society England's affinity for the unusual and the exotic. Another common use of mummy remains was to create the pigment of paint known as mummy brown, named of course for the material which gave it its rich hue. Mummy brown became popular in the 16th century, and it was made from both human and feline mummies. The reason it being so popular was for its ability to add shadows, glazing, and a vast array of flesh tones to a painting. Apparently, just one mummy could provide an artist with essentially a lifetime's worth of mummy brown paint, but despite the name, many artists never knew the origins of the pigment. Over time, the pigment was purchased less and less frequently as artists learned the morbid way that the color was sourced. In 1799, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone paved the way for the exploration of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Discovered by French soldiers during Napoleon's campaign in Egypt, the Rosetta Stone later proved to be a breakthrough in deciphering ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, owing to containing a decree issued in 196 BCE inscribed with the same text in three different scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic script, and Greek. In 1822, French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion successfully deciphered the hieroglyphics on the Rosetta Stone, and this opened the door for future archaeologists and scholars to translate other hieroglyphics. This discovery was a massive breakthrough in Egyptology and contributed to the Egyptomania experience throughout Europe. Prior to this, the exploration of the Temple of Dendera from 1798 to 1801 further fueled the intrigue by revealing the now famous Dendera zodiac on the ceiling of the temple. This ancient zodiac image is an intricately carved sculpture depicting celestial constellations and astronomical symbols. This particular type of sculpture, which displays carved images protruding from a flat surface, is known as a bas relief, and it is found in other ancient architecture throughout Egypt, Greece, Italy, and India, among other places. Places. As historians studied the zodiac and deciphered what it meant, this too intrigued people all over Europe. And to add to the growing Egyptomania at the beginning of the 19th century, Johann Ludwig Burckhardt's revelation of the Abu Simbel temples throughout his posthumous publications Travels in Nubia in 1819 and Travels in Syria and the Holy Land in 1822 played a pivotal role in introducing Egyptology to the European elite. 
These temples, previously unknown to the world, revealed key information about Ramesses II and the gods worshipped by the Egyptians in 1279 BCE to 1213 BCE. Burckhardt sadly passed away before he could see the effect his discovery had on the curious minds of Europe, but shortly after his death, Egyptologist Giovanni Battista Belzoni took up the reins uncovering and exploring the archaeological site. Burckhardt's texts and Belzoni's subsequent reports on the site continued to pave the way for a surging interest in ancient Egypt, captivating the minds of scholars and enthusiasts alike. This all now brings us to the conception of one of the most curious phenomena that emerged during this period, the trend of mummy unwrapping parties, although officially the trends can be traced back just a few years before Queen Victoria's reign. In 1834, researcher and archaeologist Thomas Pettigrew saw the buzz of Egyptomania stirring in England. He himself had a particular fascination with Egyptian mummies, having just published his first book, History of Egyptian Mummies, that very same year. Born in London in 1791, Thomas Joseph Pettigrew, apprentice to Surgeon John Taunton, assumed notable roles, including Secretary of the Medical Society of London and Surgeon to the Duke of Kent. His career in Egyptology began as an assistant to Giovanni Battista Belzoni, the Italian explorer, who discovered Seti I's tomb in 1817, a tomb which was, surprisingly, missing its mummy. In 1821, as part of an exhibition for Seti I's tomb, Pettigrew aided Belzoni and unwrapping a mummy before a group of physicians. Later, Pettigrew served as surgeon and librarian to the Duke of Sussex, engaging in both medical and antiquarian pursuits. Although it's rumored that there were mummy unwrapping events prior to Pettigrew's in 1834, his is by far the most well documented, in part due to the scientific nature of the event. On January the 15th, 1834, the sold out crowd, primarily made up of historians, archaeologists, and medical experts, gathered in the Royal College of Surgeons under the guise of scientific progress. In reality, the event was a spectacle proven by the fact that little knowledge of the mummy's identity was discovered. Pettigrew himself was particularly fixated on measuring the skulls and other bones of the mummies to determine if Egyptians were Caucasian or African in origin. Apparently, at that time, this was a point of major confusion and mystery that needed to be solved. These events became quite popular as news spread about Thomas Pettigrew's demonstrations. However, they soon became less about science. In Victorian England, wealthy and important people would come together at the home of someone who had bought a mummy. They would have food and drinks and then watch as the mummy was unwrapped. Instead of contributing to research or society as a whole, these events were more about impressing and entertaining friends. They offered a way for high society to experience the mystery of ancient Egypt firsthand. Meanwhile, the ongoing discoveries in Egypt only fueled the Victorian era fascination with Egyptology. Excavations in Thebes, documented by Carl Richard Lepsius between 1842 and 1859, deepened the world's understanding of Egyptian history and culture. Lepsius conducted multiple phases of his expedition throughout these years in the area now known as the city of Luxor, and the findings from his expeditions were published in a monumental work titled Monuments from Egypt and Ethiopia. This work consists of multiple volumes that includes detailed illustrations, descriptions, and analyses of the documented sites, inscriptions, and artifacts, and it remains an essential resource for Egyptologists and historians to this day. Needless to say, the publication of Lepsius's book gave Victorian England more insight into the enigma that was Egypt in the 19th century. The spread of these discoveries, combined with a growing interest in the exploration of pyramids and hieroglyphics, solidified Egypt's allure as a captivating and intriguing subject of study. Following this, another notable unwrapping session took place at the Paris Exhibition of 1867. Renowned archaeologist Auguste Mariat managed the archaeological section of the exhibition, and over several sessions he conducted unwrapping of several different mummies. Invitations had been given to Parisians who were particularly interested in the relatively new field of anthropology, and the events were viewed as scientific demonstrations. Reports of these demonstrations intrigued society, and further mummy unwrapping parties happened at private homes. But after 1867, there's limited documented evidence of mummy unwrapping parties. The fascination with such events had waned, and there was a growing understanding of the importance of preserving ancient artifacts for scholarly and cultural reasons. By this time, the field of archaeology and Egyptology oh, was becoming more professionalized, and scholars were focused on systematic study, documentation, and preservation of ancient remains. Eventually, as the Victorian era was coming to a close at the beginning of the 20th century, so were the mummy unwrapping parties. As societal norms evolved and ethical concerns gained prominence, 
prominence, the practice began to draw criticism and backlash. The very trends that had once captured the imagination of the elite now faced scrutiny for their perceived insensitivity and disrespect for human remains. As a result, the era of mummy unwrapping parties came to an end. Nonetheless, the fascination with Egypt endured. On November 4, 1922, a team led by Egyptologist Howard Carter began excavating the tomb of Tutankhamun. Perhaps one of the most famous mummies of all time, King Tart was found buried in a tomb which contained a treasure trove of artifacts, including furniture, jewelry, chariots, statues, and a remarkable assortment of funerary objects. The most famous discovery was the golden burial mask that covered the pharaoh's mummy. The discovery of King Tart and his tomb was accompanied by rumors of a curse of the pharaohs, which was believed to afflict those who disturbed the tombs of ancient Egyptian rulers. Several individuals associated with the expedition, including Lord Carnarvon, the man responsible for financially backing the expedition and excavation of the tomb, died under mysterious circumstances. While modern science has debunked the notion of a curse, the story surrounding it added to the tomb's allure and popular fascination. The process of conserving, cataloging, and studying the vast array of artifacts from the tomb took many years. Scholars around the world were eager to learn from the discoveries, and the Tutankhamun's treasures exhibition toured several countries, sparking widespread interest in ancient Egypt. Today, most archaeological and scientific practices now prioritize non-destructive methods of study. However, there have been a few modern-day instances where mummies have been carefully unwrapped for scientific purposes. In 1999, a team of scientists and researchers led by Dr. Angelique Corthels, a forensic anthropologist, conducted a controlled and well-documented unwrapping of a 500-year-old mummy of a Peruvian child. The mummy was excavated from the Andes Mountains and was believed to be a victim of the Inca ritual known as Capachoca. This ritual involves the careful selection of an adequate child sacrifice who was then well fed and cared for before being killed as a symbol of the Inca's political power. The unwrapping was conducted using advanced imaging techniques and took place at the University of New Mexico's Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. The study aimed to gain insights into the child's life, health, and cause of death. In 2016, researchers used state-of-the-art imaging technology, including CT scans and 3D printing, to virtually unwrap and study a set of ancient Egyptian mummies known as the Gebeline pre-dynastic mummies. These naturally mummified bodies date back to around 3,600 BCE and were discovered in the late 19th century. The study provided valuable information about the mummy's anatomy, health, and burial practices without physically unwrapping the remains. There are only a couple of recent examples of modern-day mummy unwrapping, and fortunately for archaeological preservation, researchers today rely on advanced imaging techniques, DNA analysis, isotopic studies, and other non-invasive methods to learn about the past while respecting the cultural and ethical considerations surrounding the treatment of human remains. As made apparent by the phenomenon of mummy unwrapping, whether for science or spectacle, the Victorian fascination with ancient Egypt exemplifies the complex interplay between societal norms and human curiosity. While the practices of the time may appear unconventional today, they reflect an enduring human desire to uncover the mysteries of the past. This enduring fascination, now channeled through responsible scientific inquiry, continues to shape our understanding of ancient civilizations and their contributions to the tapestry of human history.